In the opening poem of her first collection, Apology for Want, a book whose gorgeous title I envy to this day, we watch Mary Jo Bang looking at a painting of the Madonna in Antibes. It seems appropriate that this poet should find herself on the threshold of her life as a writer, focused not so much on the green-faced, inexplicably blonde virgin of the Western pictorial tradition, but rather attending to the canvas's background details. In particular, the lakes the size of dollhouse mirrors, which dot the artificial landscape beneath this picture's painted angels. Not surprising, because the speakers of Bang's poems move through the landscape of her art, like Alice in Wonderland, through a realm of miniatures, lakes the size of dollhouse mirrors, flannel mice, a smoke-filled caterpillar, and a world at the same time full of cathedral-like spaces where the self dwindles in its dimensions to a fugitive speck. Watch, for instance, how a half-eaten piece of cake may, in Bang's Wonderland, assume the cavernous architectural proportions of Tintern Abbey. Around a tabletop scattered with ruins, the abbey of an eight cake, one wall still standing, but angling in a bit, crumb comb rock dotting the sandscape of a handmade plate. Sense and nonsense, innocence and eros, the vertigo of mere being. These are the subjects of Bang's Lewis Carroll-like excursions into wonder. And now, this poet has passed through the looking glass, as it were, and come out the other side with a collection of poems which investigate the art of looking. And what a pleasure it is to watch Bang as she watches the ebb and flow of artistic fashion and innovation in the poems of this, her latest collection, Eyes Like a Strange Balloon. Here we have the image of an architectural fragment painted upon an actual architectural fragment from the year before Christ's birth. We have a Field of Permission by Picasso. We find Damien Hirst's Pickled Tiger Shark and, yes, Alice in Wonderland, rendered by Sigmar Polk in mixed media, of course. Curiouser and curiouser, Bang's ekphrastic encounters stage for us the wonder of looking, in which the eye itself, like a strange balloon, floats free of this encumbering self and takes in the world's audacious design. Mary Jo Bang is the author of Apology for Want, which won the 1996 Breadloaf Bakeless Prize, a second collection titled The Downstream Extremity of the Isle of Swans, another great title uh, from Beckett, I think, uh, and Louise in Love a winner of the Poetry Society of America's Alice Faye de, Cast de Castagnola Award for Manuscript in Progress. The recipient of numerous awards, including a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation, a Discovery Nation Award, and a Hodder Fellowship from Princeton University, Bang uh, was a poetry editor for the Boston Review and uh, is on faculty at Washington University in St. Louis. Please join me in welcoming Mary Jo Bang. I'm going to read poems from this um, book, this book, um, new book, The Eye Like a Strange Balloon, which are all, um, as um, Chiku Reddy said, encounters with artwork. Um, there's a word for that which is called ekphrasis or ekphrasic art and often ekphrasic poems somehow reproduce the artwork and then um, add as a second thought the, um, the viewer's response to it. But I've instead made the viewer's response more central to the poem and so 
um, they act more as tripwires instead of um, any kind of descriptive uh, rendering of the painting. And I've also tried to um, expand, because I think the 20th century has expanded our idea of what art is, to include photography and installations and um, film and all the different kinds of art that we um, encounter today. So the first poem I'm going to read is a film. It's a film called High Art, and it's by Lisa Cholodenko. Um, she's the director and starring... Hold on a minute. Ali Sheedy, I remember. Um, and Radha Mitchell and Patricia Clarkson. And the, the film is, if you've not seen it, basically has a number of threads. One has to do with photography, one has to do with addiction, and one has to do with desire. So a great combo. High art. There's a city outside the mind, another inside, a mind full of something becoming because, a face too small for this red mouth. Look how the line isn't a street anymore, but a track like that, the traveled, graveled shroud of a train. I'm not usually like this, a likable, a linkable like arrives without its what, parks the car. I remember the camera, the clean click, the clean cutting off of the instant, goodbye, goodbye, the slide in the sleeve, this opening eye, wanting to take everything in, sequence after sequence, the framed now that never ends, ending, the blue suit pulled from a pool of aqua dreaming, not knowing why, aside from theory, sexual configurations of glamour, what is the scene, what is the cover, the frozen waiting for focus and drive. Look, look, look. Art is what looking takes you to. A red mouth opening to say, don't look away. I'm not usually like this. The camera sliding by with its aperture open. Form, repetition, constructs, content. It happens. Here's the needle that speeds the plot to the ambush. It happens the whole truth shading desire, atmospherics predominating over drama, chiaroscuro focused on a point of desperation, the recurrent dream of a catalog of surprise revelations, having makes wanting continue, a darkness both familiar and strange. What have you got there? A translation of a story of a dream world. The sequence of events exists, here one, here two, here buckle, here shoe. Now let there be sound. Now let there be light. Once there was this now. Chiku mentioned um, the contemporary painter Sigmar Polka, a German, and he actually had a lot to do with the, um, the idea of this book because I encountered a... Um, catalog of his work, and I was so taken by his methodology, which is to take often fabric, which might have a, a repeat pattern to it, and then he'll um, gesso over perhaps the center of it, and then add some line drawings, which invites you to make up your own story, using or not using the uh, elements in the fabric. And um, I've always enjoyed encountering work like that, both poetry and um, visual art. And so I thought, I can use this. And um, I can make poems that somehow have those same kind of elements where you're invited to fill in the blanks and make your own stories. So this is one of those Sigmar Polk uh, um, Paintings is called Alice in Wonderland, and it has uh, two fabric panels that are sewn together. And on one half, the fabric repeat pattern is a boy kicking a soccer ball, and on the other side is a black background with white polka dots. And then um, in the center, in that gesso area, is um, the tenille, um drawing of the caterpillar on the mushroom talking to Alice. Alice in Wonderland. Such a fall. Watch fob and waistcoat. How late the mistake is made. 
how long the clamoring lasts. Who are you bending against a blade of green grass? Smoke fills the caterpillar. Smoke floats over the polka dot snow. Have you really changed, do you think? This is the best part of the dark edge of down. Down, down, she fell. This is the best part of the edge where one is not one, self. Don't I know it, Alice says, blinking her eyes once, twice. She took down a jar from one of the shelves as she passed it. It was labeled orange marmalade. The game was changing. There are games where one never wavers. There are games where one follows a dot-by-dot -dot disturbance. There's falling and about to fall and ground giving way. There's the beautiful act of turning to buy two and getting a free beach bag, perfect for picnics or toting and such, a flavorful favor to take on a trip to a mountain where chocolate is eaten on weekends and during the week it's placed on your pillow right next to your head, which is swimming in visions. She could almost envision it. A pool with a placid surface, mist shrouding a peak that poked through at the top to speak of impossible heights. But no, the peak was a spike on the cephalogram and she was dreaming again in a sleep clinic bed. Father was petting her forehead. Mother was stirring a soup. She'd be ever more reckless if never she woke. Now that was not said right. Some of the words had got altered. A row of button mums hedged the walkway. She stopped to enter this datum in her right as rain notebook. She knew what the button mums meant, another fall. Dying must happen quite often, said Alice. There's a um, series of polka paintings, and they're all actually um, abstract. So um, like all abstract paintings, they invite you to see things in them, like one sees giraffes in clouds. So um, they're all titled Catastrophe Theory, and they start with Catastrophe Theory 4, 3, 2. And I've never found one labeled 1, but that's clearly um, consistent with Polka's perverse humor. So um, I'm going to read the three Catastrophe Theory poems, starting with four. Catastrophe Theory 4. There are multiple versions. In one, the egg salad goes bad. In another, the baby, the bath water. In the more recent running, waving arms, poultry, and spats to conceal the absence of socks. The socks have been held back for puppet production. In the most recent, the train is a choo-choo, benign and friendly. We know it's not so, but we so wish to believe. In this one, there is also the hint of a fence and lavender which will stand for more than a violent resistance to reason. It also speaks of spilt ink, but it stays in its contour. It is, in a word, controlled. How catastrophic can that be? Clearly, the theory is not without mishap, especially along the horizon and there are unsolved portions in the right lower quadrant, a place that is tender to palpation. What you don't see, you can still feel. You can, in a word, presume that at the bottom of the bottomless, bottomless depth, the band will render splendidly from sheet music not easily found the famous one fine day in which the watchtower turns to a lifeguard beneath an unbeached umbrella and seven geese rise from the ashes like falcons off forth on swing, night falling down around the waning. Catastrophe Theory 3. Now we sit and play with a tiny toy, elephant that travels a taut string. Now we're used and use in turn each other. Our hats unravel, and that in itself is tragic. To be lost, to have lost, verbs like veritable engines pulling the train of thought forward. The hat is over, turned, and out comes a rabbit. Out comes a man with a monocle. Out comes a Kaiser. Yikes, it's history. 
that ceiling comprised of recessed squares, each leg a lifeline, each lie a wife's leg. A pulled velvet cord rings a bell, and everyone comes running to watch while a year plummets into the countdown of an open mouth. A loop of razor wire closes around the circumference of a shaken globe of snow. Yellowed newsprint with its watery text, a latticework of shadow thrown onto the clear screen of the prison wall. From a mere idea comes the twine that gives totality its name. What is theory but a tentacle reaching for a wafer of reason? The inevitable gap tragic, sure tragic. Catastrophe theory two. The foot goes forward, yes, yet there are roots and a giant orb which focuses its cyclopic eye on a moray morning. When the microcosm is dry, it's earth. Wet, it's water. Water reads electric eel, one possibility. Sun reads dust mote and mite, another. Whatever the elements, it's urban, it's pastoral, it's empty, it's open. The theory says it could always be worse until it is. Then theory fails, leaving a tracer mark. From blood you come to blood you go. Sudden things happen inside a frame. A flame is lit. Look at those pathetic wiggly squiggles. Inferno or garden? An immeasurable distance sizzles between them. Watching it all, but taking so little in just what will fit on the flat of a glass lens. The ticker is hopeful, pathetic fallacy. Look at the numbers move. The mystery of ticks, one per second, 60 per mickey. Four becomes 10, one in six, bombs, falls in a bushel, a basket, a two o'clock casket. Do you wish to stay connected? The scene blurs into the just heard. A bird outside the wide open window the warm day of March, it changes, it has all changed, the world as a distracting disaster. My, what little sense you make, said the wolf to Mary Jo. The theory rests on a tipping point, the clock steps in a direction. This is another film, um, it's a film of Shakespeare's The Tempest, and it's by... Um, um, Derek Jarman, and in which um, Elizabeth Welsh sings at the end, um, Stormy Weather. So um, this is called The Tempest, or Don't Know Why There's No Sun Up in the Sky, Stormy Weather. It's a very strange film. The urge to see through things. The day begins with a shimmer. The blue square becomes a window. The box, a building. The vertical lines, the final page in an exercise book that's closing over last year's profusion of lilacs. By the banks of the Mississippi, she sat down and wept. The rapture was over, now a melding of comic motifs with tragic. The knife on the balustrade did not bode well. She lay down in a green sweater, rested the back of her hand on her forehead. The private acts become strange when subjected to inquiry. You get on a bus. The bus takes off from the base of a column. There is singing somewhere. Then you're sitting on a mohair sofa, smoking the last cigarette that must last a lifetime. In a red dress, you answer a telephone. You say so sweetly, I... And this is um, based on a photograph by um, Cindy Sherman. It's um, part of her untitled film stills. If you know that, the first um, set of those untitled film stills were black and white photographs, and then she turned to color photographs. But the idea behind them was that by simply positioning a figure, in, in a woman, in um, a, a, a scene you somehow will trigger associations to films because film has within it certain stories. And so you place a young woman at the side of the road with a suitcase 
and um, on a lonely road at night, and we know what's going to happen. We don't even need the story anymore. So there are this kind of playing with iconic images and how they evoke stories. So this particular one um, I'm happy to read because it's in Chicago, and it's a woman coming um, off of the... Um, down the L steps, and um, she's it's bright day, and she has on like a little hat, and she's drinking a bottle of beer. So you don't know what what the um, the story is, but one can imagine some kind of disappointment has happened. Untitled number seventy, or the question of remains. The day she put on her glitz teardrops and oh hun lip gloss ate an orange on an empty, and took the eight train to Grackleville. She met a man climbing a narrow stairwell, repeating to himself, this is all, this is all. The music of a popular march played in his head. This, he said, is all, directing any further comment to a long-time opposition blooming in his chest. No, he said to the offer of a chaotic labyrinth of clouds, devotion, rain, creatures of fables and opulent solitude. Alone he entered the thicket of empty situations, the rhetorical force of conversation, muttering as he went, this is all. Apprentice to death, toxic grace, terrible and beautiful repose, dismay and murkiest waters, the blighted morning, the coordinate night, the sad fact of the pink glow of Grackleville's late iridescence. And this is um, based on a painting by um, a, a woman named Paula Rego, and she um, makes these kind of caricature-like um, paintings, or did, she, she does a lot of things, but they too um, somehow evoke stories even when um, you don't have the text. And this is called In the Garden. And um, I remembered when um, I was in the MFA program at Columbia, there was somebody in um, the workshop. And she, after the workshop, she was um, very unhappy because nobody had understood what her poem was about. And she appealed to me and said, you understand it, don't you? And I said, no, I'm really sorry, but I don't. And she said, Mary Jo, it has a garden in it. Eden. It has to be Eden. So, in the garden. I think Eden. We're all there. Kiki has her dog, her kitty, and I who love monkeys have only the lion. I wear a hat and my several hearts all live on cactus. Kiki wears pearls and that's as it should be. Life goes on, slipshod or unshoed. So many scenes and all I can do is look out. All I can do is seek shade as if sun were the worst that could happen, as if light were a symbol of knowing it's not. Beautiful Kiki, her googly eyes, beautiful monkey, his sleek silvered forehead. I wear red flowers that have fallen from never, flattened to leaflings. There is sometimes silence and sometimes sea sounds battering the edge of my dress. Here we are and we're doing the best that we can this side of passive, at the center of patience. That is the game we play. That's the exchange. Sun for shade, knowing for not. I am even. We are posing. We are poised. This is where we live. We are ever, but only when ever is all that there is. I'll read the title poem, um, part of the title, this comes from the poem. The, the entire title of the painting or charcoal drawing is called The Eye Like a Strange Balloon Mounts Toward Infinity, and it's by Olan Redon, and it was um, an illustration that accompanied a book of short stories by Edgar Allan Poe. It was done in um, 1882. Um, and it's a, a kind of desolate horizon line with a hot air balloon that's just hovering over that horizon line. And at the top of the hot air balloon is a pupil looking up. And um, so the eye, like a strange balloon, mounts toward infinity. 
We were going toward nothing all along, honing the acoustics, heralding the instant shifts, horizontal to vertical, particle to plexus, morning to late, lunch to later yet, instant to over, done to overdone, and all against a pet shop cacophony, the roof withstanding its heavy snow load, so winter and still, ambition to otherwise and a forest of wishes, meager the music floating over, the car in the driveway, in the pilot or curbside, a building overlooking an estuary, inspired by a lighthouse, always asking, has this this been built, or is it all process? Molecular coherence, a dramatic canopy, cafeteria din, audacious design, or humble, saying, we ask only to be compared to the ant, terrier, cruciate, ligament, so simple, so elegant animated detail, data from digital, and of course there's long-standing evil, the spider speaking to the fly, come in, come in, overcoming timidity, overlooking consequence, finally ending with the future, take comfort, you were going nowhere, you were not alone, you were one of a body curled on a beach, near sleep on a balcony, the negative night in a small town, or part of an urban abstraction, Looking up at the billboard hummingbird, its enormous beak, there's a song that goes, and then the curtain drops. I'll read two more poems. Um, this is Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, which is the name of a painting by Picasso, which um, many people feel began um, contemporary art. It was like an explosion in the laboratory, um, Andre, Andre Breton said, um, because he portrayed women with masks on their faces, and um, somehow that so subverted our usual expectations of um, portraiture and art that ever after nothing was the same. Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Over here our story begins and over there it continues like the idle hum of the clown car. What a pity, says the cat, that the corporal occupies the moment. The forever echoes. The electroencephalogram echoes. Someone hands you a graphic a penciled-in footprint belonging to a boy named Bart. What are we to do with this? Make it fit. The body is now a bee carcass floating on aqua. The self is consistent, but the story is made of fragments, color-coded, ballooned, or cubed, an earthquake shattering the shaken one-point perspective. All about is a field of permission, of vision, a force of ellipsis, what gives our bare legs their persimmon tint is intention plus taffy apple oil with underdrawing. We are drawn in. If we seem vulnerable under the past pattern of clouds in motion over a pale blue conveyor belt ocean, it's because we are. Sometimes we act like we love small Peruvian parrots. We hide them in our hair. And the last poem I'll read is um, called What Moonlight Will Do for Ruins. And it's um, based on a um, mixed media collage, which I did, because there wasn't any artwork for this poem. And um, it seemed that we should have one um, to end with. And um, there's also that desire to somehow um, not set oneself apart from the artist, but to actually um, then try being one. What Moonlight Will Do for Ruins. She has a theory. It's tied to the velvet that holds her hair back. She says, this is time, and undoes the ribbon. Her hair cascades. The girl no longer believes in change. Nothing can reclaim the rough of worn ridge and worn crater. Every Monday, she turns over the stones, scrapes off the tiny worms with a hand flat, and trans transforms nada. It is stupidly given, she says, of the hour. It's thin pitch, indivisible with the taxed heart. The longitude of terror, 
a conforming arc that can't be undone. Outside the mind is fact, the seafloor seasonal in the shallow, seasonal in the deep, time the illusion, no more bewildering than the woolly legs, the elastic lungs, the long tube's helly depth. Here, darling, take this, and time gives the mouth a morsel. Thank you.